Floods, fires, climate change, reacting to crisis. In the interview, environmental policy expert Klaus Töpfer. Klaus Töpfer, we'll talk about you in your capacity as a political animal and also as a very important voice in the global uh, environmental debate in just a minute. But I'd like to begin by asking you a question as a private citizen. When you're watching your evening news programmes at the moment and you see the climate catastrophes, the floods in Pakistan, the floods in China and the landslides and the fires, the devastating fires in Russia, what's your response? How do you feel? I'm more or less uh, very close to be frustrated, but again and again I'm stimulating myself to avoid such a development. Mm. Frustration is never contributing to solutions. And I'm very convinced that there are con uh, solutions, that there are very positive way out. We must be aware that we are going in the future where we will have more than 9 billion people on this wonderful blue planet Earth. Now we have 7 billion. When I was born 72 years ago, it was only 2.7 billion. So there are challenges. There must be a clear vision that Mother Earth might have limited capacity and that we have to use our brain to bring new solutions to the existing problems. And they have to do it in line with the conservation of nature. Okay. So let's establish one thing first, a, lot of, a question that a lot of people are asking themselves at the moment when we look at these three major climate catastrophes. You are the former head of the UN Environment Programme. Who better to ask, are they linked? A lot of people are asking themselves this question, are they linked? They are linked first and foremost with the fact that they have also human ingredients. The differentiation between nature catastrophes and human-made catastrophe is overlapping more and more. If you are going and uh, invest a lot of money for channelizing a river, you will see that the same rain event will have totally other consequences for the disaster. The flood is higher. It will be a disastrous consequences. If you are cutting trees, if you don't want to stabilize your soil, you will have erosion and you will increase the soil of the river and you will reduce the capacity in handling of water. So there are all those integrations. If you have a forest mainly concentrated to production of wood, something like a wood production factory, the consequences for disasters are totally others as if you have a nature forest. So they have common ingredients and if you go to Pakistan you will see it again. Of course, there was a huge, huge, huge a nightmare of a rainfall. But we also see that uh, the investment in the protection against flooding in dams and others uh, are very low. That bridges disappeared from a minute to another, mm -hmm. proving that the construction was not fair, that they didn't use the right materials to handle it. So we see it again and again, but nevertheless, yes. There is a common denominator. We are overloading nature, and nature gives us the answer. You said uh, not too long ago, we in the West, yeah, we in the West are guilty of ecological aggression. What did you mean with that, specifically? It is a very, very uh, 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 focused expression, and stick to it. Why? You see, we are subsidizing our well-being in the highly developed countries by externalizing the costs of this well-being. If we don't pay any money for the emission of CO2, so we will increase the load of the atmosphere with CO2 and we know that this has consequences for change of climate and the consequences are mainly concentrated in those countries, in those regions of the world where they never had a con uh, any contribution to this change. So we are externalizing our cost. And for them, in those countries, in Africa, and I was eight years in Africa, for this, it is something like a war. It is decreasing their possibility to overcome their bottlenecks of development, their living conditions. The people in Pakistan, they didn't contribute to the change of climate, 
but they are no suffering from so, those floods. So, so what do we do? What do we do here in the West in concrete I have, terms? We have to do our utmost to integrate those costs. That is what I repeat was other uh, professors, other scientists underlined that we have to do our utmost. That are, our are we doing enough? I mean, Germany, Germany, no, I don't believe Germany that we are is led doing by enough. Chancellor Merkel, who ironically followed you in office as Germany's environment minister way back when. She's viewed as very much the sort of the climate queen by many. But she is she doing enough to meet these demands that she's from your party, after all? The I have no idea why Germany. you believe that this was ironically a case, but I don't okay. want to go in more detail in this field. But uh, you see, a chancellor in a developed countries is also confronted quite now with the huge consequences of a disaster of the financial system. She has to overcome this as well. And there is a lot of, let me say, looking for alibis to postpone the fight against climate change. But this isn't good enough. No, that is not. If and you I, and I can't change the problems, if the Chancellor can't change the problems, I've talked to senior people at the United Nations recently, Helen Clark, Antonio Guterres, yes. development experts, the man responsible for refugees, Ivo de Boer, the climate coordinator, all these people are desperate. They don't see how they can solve the problems. Yes, they can. But, yeah, I'm very happy that you underline this feeling of not being able to solve problems. If you say this to the people on the street, they say, why are we going to election? Why are we interested in changing governments if they at the end of the day come back and say, we cannot solve it? No, we have to cut this. We must be very clear. And this is my recommendation that in fighting climate change, you have to stabilize the economy as well. You see, we came from Rio de Janeiro in 1992 and we decided that there is a right to development for each and everybody in the world. I cannot come to Africa and say, look, we in the West, we overuse the nature, so there is no uh, possibility for you anymore. No, we must make it a development chance. The perspective in the future are new technologies for renewable energies, are better energy efficiencies, is a better resource efficiency, is a better use of the ecosystem services. If we cannot convince this, we will have a very, very harsh world in front of us. We will not have a peaceful development. You see, if we are going on with our diet and others are copying us, we know that 9 billion people in the year 2050 have the consequences of uh, food demand of 12 million from today. We cannot handle it. We have to change as well. So altogether, if I give the signal, we can do nothing. Then I believe I come to frustration and that I brings me back to my first sentence here. No, we are not allowed for a pessimistic frustration. It is an easy way out. Sit back and say, let the time go. We have the chance, we have the knowledge, we have the resources better than ever in human history. And it would be a disaster not to use them. OK, that's the hopeful vision of Klaus Tapfer. A quote from a climatologist here. The number of weather-related disasters has more than doubled in the past 30 years. I want a yes or no answer now, not a, not a sort of a feel-good answer. Yeah. yeah. Is the number of climate catastrophes going to double in the next 30 years? Yes or no? No, because I'm convinced that the world so responsible people in the world will act. They will adopt and they will mitigate. And therefore I say no. Klaus Töpfer, I hope you're right. And thank you for talking to us today. Thank you so much indeed.